RimWorld is a very difficult game. Not only do you have to worry about managing to feed your colonists, but you also must have strategies in place to protect them against more violent threats, such as pirate raids or the occasional mad rat. The usual solution to this is weapons. Give Hank a Glock and you're good to go, you can pepper down just about any foe. But what would happen if this wasn't an option, if everyone in your colony was a pacifist and capable of violence? Now that would be difficult, and that is what we are exploring today, with a group of cannibals because nothing goes better with pacifism than cannibalism. We begin our journey in a southern jungle bordering an ocean on a backwater rimworld with a small tribe. We have Frog the Builder, Darklight the Intelligent Doctor with Great Bedside Manor, Wolverine the Cook, the Elder Sin Ri Kabar, a gardener by trade, and last but not least, good old Wombo Combo, the 17 year old child with little skill. Together they make up a small tribe following the Peaceful's ideology, one that focuses on community, peace, and of course, eating people. Having only a few stacks of pemmican, some logs, and medicinal herbs, we had much to do if we wanted to survive more than a few days on the rim. This is actually my second attempt at this, as my first ended tragically when a colonist by the name of Makino had a mental break due to a lack of human meat and decided to go visit some local insects who mauled her to death. Now, this would normally be annoying, but this spelled the end of the colony. You see, Makino had a pet named Moonlight, who went mad with grief after hearing the news of their master's death. To honor Makino's memory, Moonlight did what any good pet would do and went on a search for human meat. Unfortunately for the rest of the colony, the closest meat was them, and Moonlight, who could still open the doors of the colony, hunted them down one by one and slaughtered them. This did teach me an important and valuable lesson about this challenge though. You're doomed to fail. No, but it did teach me that a single animal could easily take out the entire colony who would not be able to fight back, so I needed protection and I needed it fast. After quickly assigning priorities to each colonist to complement their unique skills, I began to lay out the blueprints to a massive compound. By the end of the first day, my colonists had managed to deforest a good section of land and Frog had completed the beginnings of a massive wall for the fort that they would all soon call home. The group was so efficient that they were able to seed a rice field, which was one of the most important tasks as without a new food source we would quickly run out of our small supply of pemmican and die. Darklight and Frog worked together to build and design a primitive defense structure consisting of spike traps protecting a lightly defended door, the idea being that an attacker may try to go for that door rather for one of the airlock style gates and get trapped in a spike trap in the process. The first night the colony found a nice moment of rest with each other as they slept in the crook of a small hill keeping the ocean breeze off their skin. Also, a new love between Wolverine and Sinri Kabar began to brew here as well. The next day, the foundational walls of the compound were completed, but it was only the shell of the majestic home that the colony was soon to form. Plans were quickly drawn up to construct five spacious bedrooms, along with a communal eating area, a kitchen, and a small research lab for Darklight to study science inside of. As the first days of spring went by, the colonists began to find joy in the simplicity of their work. Within hours, they could see the fruits of their labor. A felled tree did not stay on the ground long before Frog, or someone assisting him, would add it to the walls of a bedroom, or craft it into a chair. Sinri Kabar led the charge into the fields outside of the compound, planting seeds for plants that would not only supply the colony with a much needed food source, but also with medicine and crafting materials as well. By the fourth day, the basic layout of the settlement had been completed. Every colonist had a room and a chair at the table of the dining hall. Dark Light began to research the cocoa tree, a plant that would provide chocolate to the colony, a food source but also a potential revenue source, as chocolate is worth a pretty penny out on the rim. It could also later become a convincing front if anyone be began to grow suspicious of the occasional disappearance of bodies near our home. As the afternoon of the fourth day wore on, something began to feel off. Everything was going too well, and that was when disaster struck. A local monkey, whether due to hunger or intense hatred for humans, suddenly went mad and rushed towards the defenseless colonists. After getting flashbacks to a similar scenario I had experienced not 45 minutes ago, I quickly brought the colonists inside of the compound where I hoped they would be safe behind the walls. In his old age, Sinri Kabar barely managed to make it through the wooden gates and closed them again as the monkey began clawing at them. Terrified, the colonists huddled into one of the back rooms, not knowing if the wall would hold, but it did. However terrifying the creature mere meters away from them was, it could not break down the walls they had worked so hard to build, and so everyone got back to work, albeit on projects contained within the walls. The siege of the pharaoh monkey continued on throughout the night, but the colonists quickly realized that they would have to leave their fort eventually as their stomachs began to growl heavily. The rice was not grown yet, and the only other easily accessible food was the berries outside of the compound, outside with the monkey. 
The desperate colonists even considered butchering the dog, but stopped themselves as they could not go through with such an act of violence. As the new dawn broke, the hungry and tired colonists began to open their eyes, and they noticed something. The infernal screams and scratching of the monkey were gone, leaving them with only the sounds of the jungle. Knowing that she was taking a chance, Wolverine ventured past the walls for the first time in almost a day and tiptoed her way over to a berry bush. Realizing that it was now safe, she invited the rest of the colony to join her, and they all rejoiced that they were not, in fact, going to starve to death. With their first crisis averted, Darklight, a de facto leader of the group, realized that they had not given their fortress a name, or their tribe for that matter, as they were the only survivors of a once glorious tribe that had been massacred. After pondering this thought for a while, Darklight decided to call their tribe the Definitely Not Cannibals Tribe to throw those suspicious off the scent. He took this a step further when he named the fortress Not Cannibal City, Please Come Visit Us Without Weapons. Now with a name like that, no one would ever suspect a thing. Also something I noticed when editing was that Darklight definitely misspelled cannibals. Uh, this was entirely his fault and not because I can't spell. By the sixth day on the rim, things were starting to look up again. Well, sort of. Even though Not Cannibal City Please Come Visit Us Without Weapons had now been established and had primitive defenses, the colony was still facing a massive food shortage, with the rice still not being ready to harvest, and our wood supply available for construction projects was dwindling. On top of that, at 3 in the afternoon, which is surprisingly around the same time that the monkey attack occurred, Gristal, a member of a gang of pests called the Pest Gang, raided us. The colony immediately enacted the plan that they had spent so long preparing for, and ran back to the inside of the compound where they shivered at the thought of what Gristal would do to them if she managed to get inside. Gristal would soon begin her assault with an attack on the south side of the compound by brashing a knife into the wall. Knowing that this could result in all of their deaths, Frog leaped, get it? Because his name is Frog. Haha, <laughs> bad joke. Anyways, Frog leaped into action and quickly built a secondary wall behind the one Crystal was carving into. As Crystal brought down a final knife strike breaking through the wall, she was frustrated to see yet another obstacle keeping her from the colony. It is important to remember in these situations that frustration can lead to anger, and we all know that anger leads to hate. And hate, well in this case, hate leads to cold-blooded murder of the first degree. Now that you can understand how Gristal was feeling, you can sympathize with her as she runs to the east side of the compound to bash down a door. But Frog is quick as well and begins constructing a spike trap to hopefully snag the pest if she were to come inside. Realizing that her efforts were in vain, Gristal came up with an idea, a maniacal idea, an idea that not even the most demented cannibal would ever consider. She set fire to the cotton fields, not the cotton fields, and more importantly, that is going to spread to the rest of the compound, possibly killing us all. Now, it is important to understand Gristal for what happens next. Gristal probably comes from a small family in the pest gang. She is probably a single mother of two children who works hard every day to feed them. She was probably assigned to attack Not Cannibal Pl City, Please Come Visit Us Without Weapons, and did it for her kids. That's why what happens next is a tragedy. Well, at least that's some food for our starving co- Wait, what the f*** are you doing? We should have slaughtered the dog when he had the chance. Who's going to want to eat a corpse with dog bite chunks taken out of it? Anyway, the colony worked together to fight the f raging fire and was soon helped by the rain. They had now successfully survived their first raid. While everyone was distracted, Sin Rikabar managed to get some alone time with Crystal's corpse and ate a few bites here and there. A few minutes later, Darklight had a taste of the poor woman, and while his saliva was still drying, Wolverine got a taste as well. The first case of cannibalism was accompanied by more good news. A caravan of traders combined with the harvesting of rice finally managed to stabilize the colony's food situation. As spring continued, more improvements and advancements were made around the compound. A warehouse for storing goods was constructed, and the cocoa tree that Darklight had spent so long researching was finally ready to be planted. Frog and Darklight had a brief discussion about how they were going to get more of that tasty human meat, and it was decided that a prison would be built within the hill that, that the group had spent their first night in the shadow of had protected them when their future was uncertain, and it would be able to protect their food as well. With the end of spring fast approaching, the colonists realized that they still had no official leader, but in a unanimous vote they decided to have Frog take on the role of the Cleric of Divism, a very important figure in the Peaceful's ideology. His first command was to begin planting a massive cocoa farm, one that would bring the colony immense wealth and prosperity in the future. 
The colonists hoped that they would be able to finish out the rest of the spring without any more events, but on the 13th there was a mad rat attack. However, the colony had prepared for something like this, and quickly executed the get into the compound plan. The rat was quickly killed by some visiting merchants, but the fact that it was now barely a blip in the colonists' routine showed that they had made major progress in their defense department. With confidence that they were now ready for what the future had to bring, the colonists prepared for the coming summer. They expanded their food storage and exterior walls, with the hope that they would be safer in the coming season. The cocoa trees had begun growing as well, and even though the colony was still looking at weeks of planting, they were prepared for it. Frog, Dartlight, Wolverine, Sinri, Kabar, and Combo had all made it through the test of spring, a season of firsts. Into the summer, they would take with them the experience that they believed would be invaluable to their survival. Things August began with a bang, with another assault from the pest gang. A man named Beatface had decided to come and attempt to beat our faces, but we were prepared. With the experience of the previous raid under our belt, Frog and Combo worked together to build secondary walls as Beatface attempted to break into our fortress. He mainly fit focused on assaulting the western side of the base at first, which highlighted a weakness in our fort. Because the bedrooms are connected to the exterior wall, they are harder to defend than the east side of the compound where all of the spike traps had been placed. Though it was difficult, the colony continued to manage to hold their own against the face-beating pest. Midway through the battle, the colony received amazing news. A bartender named Octave had crashed in a transport pod a few hundred meters away from the base. Even better, Octave was paralyzed due to paralytic ambasia, a condition that he could recover from over the next few seasons. The colonists began to salivate about the helpless paralyzed man, someone that they could not bring themselves to kill, but there are many ways to skin a cat, or in this case, a paralyzed man. As Beatface realized that he would never be able to breach the fortress walls due to the efforts of Combo and Frog, he made the decision to light one last wall on fire before leaving. This decision was humorous as the city was experiencing a massive rainstorm at the time. But with the threat of Beatface gone, the colony was finally able to begin to get back to business. Learning from the previous battle, Frog, along with the suggestions from Darklight, drew up plans to place spike traps around the perimeter of the base on the west and south sides to protect the vulnerable bedrooms, as well as adding many traps placed in random intervals near the front of the base to catch any raiders by surprise. While those two worked on the traps, Combo rescued Octave from the threat of the outdoors. Now the colony was faced with a problem. How were they going to murder Octave? They eventually decided that the best course of action would be to lock him in the prison and starve the poor man to death. Over the next few days, the colony started the harvest of many of the different plants that they had sowed in the previous season. Much needed herbal medicine was brought into storage, along with the recreational smoke leaf drug that would help the colonists manage their stress levels of living on the rim. The surviving cotton was also harvested, giving the colony a highly valuable resource that could be used to make clothes along with comfortable furniture. After three days had passed, Octave finally succumbed to his lack of food, and in the process became what he could not receive. Combo began butchering the man almost as a rite of passage for the young teen, to finally become an adult. The strips that remained of Octave would bring the remaining colonists great joy over the coming days. As the summer days went by, Darklight worked tirelessly in his lab, studying new technologies that could be used to help the colony, and he was successful, learning the best ways to sew clothes, create furniture, and much, much more. Midway through the season, he even began to study electricity, a technology that would revolutionize how the colony operates. On the 11th of August, as the sun went down, a crash was heard outside of the compound. Another transport pod, this time carrying a teenager named Emily, had crashed close to the city. The girl was quickly captured and Darklight requested to be allowed to perform a few experiments on her. And by experiments, he really meant harvesting of organs. You see, the colony was strapped for cash, and a lung or a liver can get you some much needed silver if you talk to the right caravan leader. We only ended up harvesting a kidney, but this is still a positive. In the midst of these operations, the colony was once again attacked by the gang of pests. This time, a rider named Kemp was charging toward the colony armed with some toxic grenades. The gang must be getting desperate, as not only did they once again only send a single person, Kemp is a 15 year old and doesn't have a real weapon. I was so unconcerned about this threat, I actually forgot to tell the colonists to gather behind the walls, and as a result, Frog unfortunately inhaled a small dose of toxic gas. Nowhere near enough to have any negative lasting effects, thankfully. I quickly ordered Frog inside, and the new defenses that he had created quickly took out the invader. The defenses around the colony had now become strong enough that a single raider no longer posed much of a threat. Darklight had managed to pull a single kidney from Emily, and now she was slated for death by starvation. In editing this, I'm realizing that I could have just euthanized my food. Well, too late now. 
Summer came to a close as Emily's life came to a close, providing us with yet another body to satiate the ravenous colonists. As the fall approached, it was clear that the colony was now fully established. Over the course of Jogus, it had survived several raids and trials, and gotten more sweet, sweet meat. From Senri Kabar's perspective, the colony's future monetary prospects were looking bright as well, as the orchard of cocoa trees was finally fully planted. As the season of fall started, many new problems started sprouting up around the colony. The gardeners working in the fields started to experience heat stroke, and there was a constant lack of wood. On top of this, the husky, apparently named Calvin, died unexpectedly on the fourth day of the season. This made the colonists quite upset, but they managed to not have a major mental break. They barely went by before the colony was raided once again by a member of the Gang of Pests. They really are becoming pests at this point. This raider was much smarter than his predecessors, however, and immediately set fire to the cotton field. He did this before running headfirst into two spike traps, and began to crawl away from the compound. He did not make it very far with his injuries, though, and collapsed mere meters away from the edge of the map. Seeing this, Frog sprinted over to the man and dragged him back to the compound before throwing him in the dungeons to starve to death. The next hurdle to cross came when the smoke leaf crop was infected with a blight. Thankfully, the colony worked together to dig out all the diseased plants before the infection spread. Everyone was glad that only the smoke leaf had been affected, and not something like the cocoa trees that they had spent so long planting. The blight had taken place midway through the wedding of Wolverine and Senri Kabar, who had been lovers since the early days of spring. Dark Light and Frog decided it was time to improve the interior of the compound, and decided to move the rice fields to the outside of the walls with the rest of the farmland, and replace it with several buildings to serve as a hospital and an area for production as well. Halfway through the season, the colony was once again the victim of a savage monkey attack, although this time they did not have to cower in fear of being mauled. The defenses had proven themselves time and time again, and they were able to subdue the monkey as well. On the 12th of September, Darklight proudly announced that he had finished his studies of electricity, meaning that soon the colony would be able to utilize electrical appliances. Frog took this opportunity to begin modernizing the bedrooms in the colony as well. For as long as the colony had existed, everyone had simply slept on the ground. Frog started the process of giving everyone proper beds, dressers, and end tables so that they could all live a more comfortable lifestyle. September ended with the biggest problem being that there was nothing to do. Half of the colony was idle, the fields had all been tended, the food had been cooked, and there wasn't much left to do. This could not be less true for the coming months as Darklight and Frog planned out how they would utilize electricity to the colony's advantage. The coming winter brought slightly colder temperatures for the first few days which much of the colony was thankful for. After successfully researching electricity, Darklight began down the path to gun turrets, as these would prove to be a much better defense against all types of enemies. The low temperatures did not last long though, as on the third a heat wave struck, bringing back widespread heat stroke. As the first windmills were being constructed, and the infrastructure for wiring was laid, the colony was hit with an iguana manhunter pack that died instantly to the minefield of spike traps that had been erected around the outside of the compound. The fourth of the season brought with it the first harvest of the chocolate that the colony had spent so much time and effort cultivating. Not only is it a food source that will improve people's moods, but it will also provide much needed silver to the colony as well. Although through the use of smoke leaf joints, the colony was already successful financially. The chocolate had the potential to take us from backwater fort to major trade city. After the heat wave ended, December proved to be the easiest month. The colonists kept busy and stayed happy as well. By the 8th, electricity was finally being used around the colony in the forms of lights, brightening up the dark rooms that the colonists had previously worked, slept, and ate in. The peace was soon broken, though. The Thum Monk Union had decided to send two of its citizens to attack, not Cannibal City, please come attack us without weapons. They had, in fact, brought weapons, and the bigger issue was that there were two of them. I believe that the game kept sending only one attacker due to our low wealth, and the fact that all of our colonists are incapable of violence, but probably because of the cocoa harvest, the difficulty had increased. The raid started, first with an attack on a turtle that had self-tamed and joined the colony, that no one had even ever acknowledged. It was the first to go. The colonists carried out the new plan that they had practiced to lure the raiders in, and it was kind of working. The central spike trap corridor with six traps managed to kill the first raider with four, but the second raider was still coming. Luckily, they stepped on two of the spike traps in the minefield, which took them out. Wolverine quickly got to work butchering their corpses. Nothing much of note happened for the rest of December. 
That was until the 13th. The 13th is a day that will live in infamy. Late that evening, something would cross the border into Not Cannibal City, Please Come Visit Us Without Weapons. A three-year-old feral child. Biotech recently added children, but I had n never thought that there would be a th feral three-year-old running around. I immediately had no idea how to deal with this. At first I thought, oh well, it's not like I could arrest him. And then I thought, maybe I can. It turns out that you are able to arrest people who are awake without a weapon. So I sent Darklight. He had a 50% chance to successfully arrest the child, and he succeeded. It was like taking candy from a baby, except for the fact that the baby was the candy. After throwing Henri, the child, in a cell, I decided to starve him to death like any of the other prisoners we had taken. Little did I know that this would lead to a catastrophe. The next morning, a group of visitors arrived at the colony, and I could not help but laugh uncontrollably about the fact that the colony had taken a three-year-old prisoner, and it was probably really awkward for the visitors to not know what the feral child-like sounds coming from the prison were. As the thought of eating a random feral toddler really started to take hold in my mind, I knew that this entire year had been worth it. This was one of my favorite moments ever in Romworld. Little did I know that it was about to become even more hilarious. On the 1st of April, Mary, making it a year since the colony had begun, Henri went berserk. This was due to his mood being low, mostly because of the advanced starvation that he was suffering. None of my previous prisoners had experienced mood breaks, and I did not have any failsafes in place to deal with something like this. I was not very worried though, and ordered Frog to build a wooden wall on the outside of the prison. As Frog began constructing the wall, something terrifying happened. Henri broke down the first door, leaving only one door between him and the rest of the compound. I started getting a little scared, but as Frog rushed to finish the wall, Henri burst through the second door, and I became terrified. Now, I would like you to take a moment and imagine what it would be like to capture a three-year-old child and plan on eating it, only for it to burst out of its cell, breaking out of your secure prison. Frog stumbled backward at the sight of Henri and began to run for his life. Henri, had the potential to massacre the entire town. Henri first walked, or crawled depending on if the feral child can walk properly yet, over to Darklight's lab first, and proceeded to break down the door. During the chaos of this, Combo walked around the corner to see the child had escaped and rushed into the prison to hide. Still on orders to build a wall, Frog proceeded to barricade Combo inside. Meanwhile, Henri broke down Darklight's door, alarming the researcher. Henri began to beat Darklight senseless, and there was nothing I could do as I watched a three-year-old smack the shit out of a 49-year-old doctor who had originally captured the child. I allowed Combo to escape, but she immediately ran and hid inside the prison again to avoid the rampaging child. The fight between Henri and Darklight ended bloodily. Henri had beaten Darklight to a pulp and left him stuttering and grasping for air on the floor. Darklight had only hit the child once in the arm in self-defense, but if anything, that made Henri more enraged. The child began to search for his next victim, as the effects of malnutrition took hold over his body. He managed to break into a warehouse where Sinri Kabar was hiding and hit the old man several times. After stepping out of the warehouse, Henri finally collapsed due to a lack of food, and Frog managed to throw him back in prison. Due to the stress of the whole ordeal, people across the colony began to have mental breaks, but all the stress dissipated as Henri died in his cell. Wolverine fetched the corpse and proceeded to chop the small child into even smaller pieces. And with that, the story for today comes to an end. We started with the leaderless tribe against the world, and ended with a massive compound with working electricity, an almost limitless stock of food, and a minefield of spike traps as a defense. Although our greatest foe was a feral three-year-old, I think that definitely not Cannibal's tribe did quite well for themselves. I hope you enjoyed, and I hope you have a wonderful day.